To what? 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 What the tech? Welcome to the What the Tech podcast, where we talk about business and office technology, and put our 20 years of expertise to discussing trends and issues impacting the workplace. Hi, right. right, Rolando Rosas here, and hi, I'm Dave Kelly. All right, and welcome to another episode of What the Tech. All right, so before we introduce our guest, I'd like to give a shout out to some previous guests of ours. Listen, a big shout out to Eva Reed. Eva joined us a couple of months ago where we discussed women in tech and geo mapping. Eva, hope everything's going great. I'm still learning from you. Thank you for all your content that you've been posting out there on LinkedIn. And also I'd like to give a shout out to Barbie Brewer. She also was a guest on our show and she revealed why remote work can land top talent. Barbie just recently became the official HR leader of LG Global Ads Solution. So back to you, Ro. Yeah, congrats, Barbie. I know that's a big move for you, so do your thing. And you know what, Dave? Do we have a sponsor message today? You know what? I think I do. Hey, you know what, Nicole? Let me ask you this. You know what? Have you ever been affected by slow internet or have you ever done a podcast where maybe you get caught, cut out? freeze frame or bad audio we had a guest on recently and they didn't have great internet and it affected the show a little bit but uh, listen a lot of people out there they might be paying for slow outdated business internet why would they do that internet it's the lifeblood of your business because seconds matter and no one has time to wait the sponsors would go to circuitloops.com for instant quotes on fast fiber internet, backup wireless, and broadband. Quickly compare and save. Again, if the internet is the lifeblood of your business, seconds matter, check out circuitloops.com, compare and save. Terrific. Dave, before we bring on our guests, let me tell you a little bit about Nicole. Nicole is joining us from the Twin Cities of Minnesota, my old hometown. I don't know how she survives the winter, but she'll tell us how she does that. She went to St. Cloud State. I went down the street in the Twin Cities in St. Paul, but let me tell you a little more about her. She is the CEO of Prosper Wealth Financial, a wealth advisory firm. Nicole is an entrepreneur. She's a super mom, an accomplished author of multiple books. She's a philanthropist, and you know what? a money maven. Something I found really interesting about her, and I'd love to ask her some questions about, is that she's a registered NFLPA financial advisor. I'd love to hear some stories about that. And so much more, we could have written three pages on introducing her, but I will let her come on, talk about her story, tell us more about her. Nicole, come on out of the green room and introduce yourself to our audience. Hello. Hi, Nicole. How are you? Hi, thanks for having me. Awesome. Great to have you. We love having you here. Nicole, before we get started, I know you are a big Minnesota Vikings fan, and so am I. My daughter I'm... is a mini Viking cheerleader. She's 12. Oh, get out of here. So she here was we go. doing the school chant at the stadium two weekends ago. I'm a New England fan, born and bred. Our intro is Ozzy Osbourne Crazy Train. Not as not as cool as that. I really like that chant. That's fun. Rolando tried to make me do that last year. I also refused. <laughs> <laughs> I try to poke and prod Dave as much as I can, given that he's a New England fan. And they don't have Brady anymore, right? So they're going to okay. be in the desert for a few years until they figure it out. Maybe. That's all right. <laughs> We're still fans. We'll always, I'll always be a fan. I won't give up. Won't turn my back. Nicole, I, you have a very interesting bio with so many accomplishments. And one of the things that really, to me, really stood out was that you've been in business for nearly 20 years. You're on year number 19, I believe. We just accomplished this March, our 20th year in business. And it's not an easy road. And not a lot of people are cut out for it. I believe somewhere at, that the Small Business Administration has something like 1% of all businesses make it to year number 20. So congratulations on where you are right now. Yeah, but congrats. what I wanted to ask you was, what has been the hardest thing to master as an entrepreneur? Because to get to where you are, year number 19, there's a lot 
that you have to do right in order to get there. So what would you say would be the hardest thing that you've had to master over these years? I still feel I'm trying to master it. <laughs> it's every day. It's juggling everything. I don't like to use the word balance. I like to use blend, but especially mm -hmm. being a single mom, a full-time single mom and a full-time business owner, it's how do I make sure that I'm keeping all the balls in the air? And when you're a business owner, it's not just the business. And if you're developing a product or for me, it's the financial advice. It's okay, now I'm a manager of people, let alone, yet I'm also the HR person, let alone I'm also the cleaning company, <laughs> let alone <laughs> and I, I own the building and I'm also the janitor of that and the maintenance person. And so the hardest part is learning about so many different things and being an expert in so many different things and or realizing when is the time to give it up and delegate and really find other people that can do things for you or help assist you. And that was the difficult thing for me because I'm my mother, my parents both, but really my mother raised me to be very independent. And she's Nicole, if you want something, you've got to go do it and get it on your own. If you want to be president of the United States, go for it, but yeah. don't expect anyone to help you. Right. And so that's how I, like, I attack every day is, okay, this is what I want and I got to go get it. And I really ha still have to stop myself to this day to be like, oh my gosh, I've got this amazing team of people and empowering them, especially now on January 6th is when, he, when we hit our 20 year anniversary. Oh, and wow. so it's really taking the time to say, okay, I need to do things differently today than I did 20 years ago, because it's a totally different business and a totally different entity. It's realizing that how I did things 19 years ago is not how I should be doing things today let alone is how not I should be doing things 10 years from now mm -hmm. as the business has evolved. Because 20 years ago, it was me. <laughs> and well, I was married, so yep, there's a little yep. bit more to that. <laughs> yep, but, yep. but it was me, and then eventually I had an intern, where now there's nine people here. And really, it's realizing and recognizing that my role is different than it was when I was first getting the business started. There's a post that you that I saw on LinkedIn that you summarized some of this, that where you're saying you... We're watching Netflix, writing an email, the kids were running around, writing the next book, being an author and all that. And I, being a business owner is challenging enough. And then you throw all of that stuff into the mix and you just have to find a way to be able to conquer all these things. And I know you were joking, but boy, that is so true. When you're running the ship, you got to be able to compartmentalize be able to be a specialist in almost all these things and at least have an idea of what those are like so that you can have the vision for the company and the rest of your employees. Absolutely. And it's really focusing on what's your why. That's what we ask clients. What is their money for? What are they, what are we investing their money for? What's their why? And it's the same thing as a business owner. What's your why? Why did you start your business? What's your goal in making sure that you're living that out? A, a friend of mine, White, has a company called the 100 Year Manifesto. And it's this exercise that you go through and actually have, I have mine right here. This, and I posted it out on LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook and different places. And basically it's, you go through this whole series of like questions, you watch these videos, but it really, the summary of it is like, what's your why? And this is my mission statement, my dreams, my values, what's important to me. And I really feel like I've been at this midlife crisis <laughs> and that's part of the reason why I did this exercise. Of, okay, like here I am 20 years in business. What's the next 20 years look like? And what's, what is it all for? And what's really important to you and what really matters? Because that determines where you should be spending your time every single day. And then asking yourself, okay, at the end of the day, am I really happy? Am I really mm. fulfilled? Important what did point. I do that was helping me get where I want to go? Or how did I help someone else? And I'm sure the why has probably changed over the years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I never planned on being a financial advisor. My plan was, I went to St. Cloud State for international business and marketing. My plan was to go to law school. I wanted to be a name like Madeline Albright or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Like I wanted to make global change. And when I had lived over in Germany, I had fell, just fell in love with the United Nations. And I'm like, I'm going to go to law school and work for the UN. I'm going to make all this change. Then life doesn't necessarily go the way you want it to go. Right. <laughs> so that's how I ended up as a wealth advisor really was through my now ex-husband and he, this is what you're going to do. And then I really realized like, oh my gosh, like I'm a survivor of domestic violence. Now here I am in this career that 
I never planned on. I feel kind of stuck and I don't really love it. Like, how can I love it? And that's where I sat down one night and rewrote my bucket list. And that's where the live it list came about. And now, now I see my why, like it, it's all about inspiring and helping people with their life and with their money and helping people achieve those what's on their live it list items, because that's truly what matters. Otherwise, what are you working for? What's really the point of why you're doing things? Sure. We talk a lot about lifetime learners and folks that are always learning and they don't want to stop learning. But you have an interesting part of your story. When you were a child, I had heard that you went, some kids were going to summer camp and you went to a business camp. And when I heard about the story, it was very intriguing and I wanted to pull my son in, but he wasn't around. Tell us a little bit about the business camp that you attended when you were young. I went to Geek Week. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I, it's called Minnesota Business Venture. It still exists to this day. I was their first student that attended their camp that, that was then on their board. And so it's hosted at a college campus. And so when you're a high school student, you then get to stay on a college campus for a week, which is oh, cool. just one right. in itself an amazing experience. But then generally executives or CEOs from companies volunteer their time and they are business leaders. And you're, you, when you go to this camp, you're set up in a company. And so you have someone leading that company that actually is in the real working world as an executive, as a CEO, as a business owner. And you come up with a business plan. We played the stock market game. We had mock interviews. And that really opened my eyes because prior to that, I always loved to write and I loved communications. And so originally I was wanting to be a news anchor, a reporter, be a writer. And my parents really, I was the first generation to go to college. And my parents really were like, Nick, you need to go to school for business. Like you need to go to school for something more broad. And that really, I am so grateful for that because it, I really truly believe that philosophy. I am doing communications. I'm writing for LinkedIn. I've written five books. I'm on TV generally once a week. I've always been interviewed on podcasts and various different things. So yes, I have the communication side. But yet I have the background in business and now I've owned my business for almost 20 years. And so I feel really blessed for that. And Minnesota Business Venture was a pretty big turning point for me because here I was, you know, not running around, hanging out in the lake in the summer. <laughs> I was at Geek Week learning how to write a business plan and a marketing plan and having just this amazing, great experience. But being part of that board and helping to mentor a younger generation, that's amazing to have someone with your expertise and have that connection. Have you stayed in touch with any of the students that you had worked with in that organization? Yeah. It's, it's so cool. It's a lot of them are connected with me on LinkedIn. And one is a trader, one, another is a, another financial advisor. Some people are in marketing some people own their own business. There's one in particular who's extremely successful. And it's just, that's, it's like being a parent. So you're like, oh, or even like with my employees, I'm like, oh my gosh, look at this. This is like so cool. Really being able to help and inspire someone else and help shape how they think about their life, let alone their future, let alone inspiring them of how they think about their, themselves. Nicole, I wouldn't be surprised if one of those students that you had worked with has been part of some program or a breakout session where they have to talk about people that they look up to and their mentors. And I'm sure that they have all, I'm sure that there's people that have mentioned you in those types of conversations. That's my goal. Yeah. It sounds a lot like what your foundation, you almost read like your mission statement completely there. You want to empower men, women, and children in Minnesota so that they can find happiness and live their life to their fullest. Tell us a little bit about that. How have you, how has your foundation been involved in the lives of Minnesotans? We, over the years, would do a huge, big event and the pandemic stopped that. And so now we're having our first one since the pandemic on October 14th. And so generally most of the things that we do are in October because that's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And, and as a survivor, August 4th of 2010 was the day that a warrant was put out for my ex-husband's arrest. My We were working together. I had a different company name because as part of the divorce, I had to give him the company name, the website, the 12 financial advisors, and I started all over. But on August 4th of 2010, my daughter was six months old and my son was two. And the police came to my house after the 911 call and they handed me a card. 
And I knew what, I mean, and the card was to a domestic violence shelter near our home. And I was well aware. I had been going there and volunteering and teaching divorce dollars and cents classes for years, as well as the other domestic violence places around the Twin Cities and around really Minnesota. And so it clicked with me. Oh my gosh, like now this was like the first light bulb where I'm like, oh, no wonder why I've been like volunteering at these places because I had that personal connection. I'm like, I could see that in myself. But they handed me this card and then that was it. And I, from even that moment, like that night, like I made so many mistakes and I have super supportive parents. I'm college educated, but as a survivor of domestic violence, you're so isolated. One of the things that happens is like, you don't have your connections and your support structure that you used to have. Right. And so I just committed to myself, like when I get out of this, I want it to be that it's not just, here's a card and good luck, but here's a support system for you for the whole year. And so what we do is we take nominations in October and anyone can nominate anyone. And it could be per someone that is in a situation that they're wanting to get out or someone that has gotten out of a situation, but they're kind of like really struggling and trying to get back on their feet to really find themselves and really get healthy. And so we, what happens then is, so we take the nominations in October, we pick someone and then we provide a holiday for them that they maybe wouldn't have received. And so we adopt their family and my kids and I, we go out shopping as well as my employees will get involved. And we, so this, the woman for this year, she was pregnant when this all happened, as well as she had a little one under the age of two. And so my daughter was just thrilled with buying all these birthday outfits and <laughs> diapers and tons of things. And but it, you're providing someone with an experience for the holidays that they wouldn't have otherwise. And so it's extremely rewarding. And so that kind of is the kickoff. And then in January, I meet with them. We've been doing these via Zoom. I meet with them and what are their needs? What are they looking for? And then we pull those people together. And so the woman this year it was the life coach and the attorney made more of a focus. Whereas we had two, one woman last year where she had part of her issue was she just ignored her taxes. And so oh. the CPA was more important. And so we just pull in and the, we have a group, whoever that group is. So it's me giving financial advice. Usually that's an attorney giving legal advice, the life coach, the therapist, maybe a therapist for the kids, CPA, mortgage broker, realtor, whatever these people need, we're there as a team and we meet them with them regularly and help them. And then when we get to the end of the year, I take them to the Mall America with a stylist mm. and they get a thousand dollar shopping spree. And then we send them to a salon and they get a new haircut. And so the woman actually just had her appointment last week. And so she's got a new hairdo. She has a new wardrobe. She, her court stuff is almost done, but the biggest thing, um, it's what I needed was confidence. And so that's really what we're providing for these people is we have, we've got you, here's your support system. For, and I have the chills as I'm talking, here's the support system that we have for you for the whole year to help you with whatever you need to get back on your feet. So. Well, it that sounds wonderful. transformational. Yeah. Like you're not just, here's a couple dollars, get on your feet I mean, for somebody that needs their confidence boosted because they were in a very difficult situation. I would imagine your life, you, you can't even hold yourself up in the morning in right. some ways. And you're making it so that you're helping them maybe learn a couple of skills, help them in their situation and trying to get them way beyond, not just beyond, but way beyond where they were prior to all this madness. And wow. one of the women that's speaking at our event in October, I don't know that she actually would be here if we hadn't have helped her get out. Like it was just getting so physical and so dangerous. And so it's just all about helping people transform and get their life back. Because for me, I feel so grateful of where I am. And every day I'm, that's like my whole focus is helping me be happy, my kids, my employees or clients, anyone inspire people. But it took me a long time. I mean, I was in 10 years of court and I don't want that for someone else. Like the amount of stress that you have that then affects you physically, it's just, it's not okay, let alone the stress that you have when you're in that relationship, getting out. And so it's all about helping people be healthy and be happy. That's that, awesome. And Nicole, yeah. for those that don't know the foundation, hold on a second, Dave. And for those, it's the Nicole Biddendorf Foundation. So if you want yeah. to get involved, you want to contribute, you want to donate, 
You can go on Nicole's website where she's got a bunch of information about it. So if you want to get involved and help her out with that, go ahead and do that. Dave, go ahead. Take it away. That's all very impressive stuff. I love meeting people that are here to help others. Congratulations and to the local, to your community. And I hope that there's others within other states that will take your lead and do similar things to help out. That's where I won the Enterprising Woman of the Year Award. And I was in, I was in Tampa, Florida, or Clearwater, Florida, and received that. And I met a woman that actually runs, she's a psychologist and she runs a whole program out of Washington, DC. And so her and I have been taught, like, I would love to take this nationwide. And, and really, it's just all, it's all about making change. I'm not Madeline Albright, I'm not Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but I still have those aspirations to make change and make an impact in people's lives. And absolutely, yes. I, my goal is to not only help people with their finances and keep growing Prosper Well, but really to leave a legacy and have a foundation that continues on beyond me. Yeah, very exciting. I'm sure that there's people growing up, there's girls growing up that say, I want to be like Nicole Middendorf when I, when I grow up. <laughs> And I'm not, I, I know it seems that I'm kind of saying that with some humor, but you're an inspiration and I love what you do. And I love the content that you put out and I love the advice that you provide. And I just love your story and all these accomplishments. Being that we're in September, it's the NFL season. Da, 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 it's getting all excited yes, for yes. this. Home opener. Oh my God. I can't believe it's already September. So you're part of the NFL Players Association. Tell us about that. <laughs> Yeah. I never planned on be, being that, and it was a series of events. I'm a certified divorce financial analyst, and so there was a former Twins player that came to me with his wife, and in the divorce world, most of my work is all act representing the woman, and just behind the scenes to like help her figure this out. My goal really is to keep people out of court, and this one in particular, I was helping the husband and the wife, so I was more or less, more or less acting as a neutral. And it came down to the fact that he had retired as a Twins baseball player and he became a financial advisor. But they had been cashing out about two to 300 grand a year out of his retirement account. And he was under the age of 59 and a half. So they were paying not only state and federal income taxes on the money, but also a 10% penalty. Mm -hmm. And they were doing that to keep this lifestyle that they were living when he was an active twins player. Dang. And so that was like this first, I had to, I helped them get divorced and basically she had to go get a job. They had to sell the house. She ended up with the twins baseball pension plan and nothing else. And I was, I was just like, this is not okay. <laughs> Then I had a client who more or less was like a, an agent and said, I have all these young players. Would you be willing to help them? Take time with them, help them with a budget, help them with their cash flow. Some of them may not make it great or big. Would you do this? I'm like, sure. So I started helping them. And then you add in the component that my son, who's now 14, had originally the dream of he wanted to play for the NFL <laughs> and just yeah. who, lives and breathes football. Which kid doesn't doesn't dream that? And he still does. He still lives and breathes football, but all of this stuff at the same time. And so I, I started spending some time at NFL events. I'd have my son go to various different things. And then I learned about the NFL PA and more or less was like, oh my gosh, like, why am I not involved with this? And I also, because at the same time, the live it list stuff was happening. And I learned that one in three Americans is happy. I learned that if you spend more money on experiences, you're going to be happier than if you spend money on things. I also then learned the bankruptcy rate of these athletes. And I What's was like, the, I've got what? to stop this. Like, how, uh -huh. how can I help, you know, make something happen? And then, and then I got connected to now one of my dear close friends, Dr. Jen Walter, the first female NFL football coach at Arizona. And so with her help, I developed this program of like, how can I teach athletes on and off the field to be very fiscally responsible? And, and I can't help. There's many of them that I just can't help. Like we live in such a world of Instagram and showing bling and all yeah. of that. But there's a handful of them that I can help that want to be more successful off the field than on the field. And so those are the particular athletes that I love to work with is ones that look at, yes, I'm a football player, or yes, I'm a baseball player, or what a basketball or whatever sport that I'm in. And what am I do what am I gonna be doing when my career is over? Because for most athletes, it's a shorter, it's a short period of time that they're receiving mm -hmm. a significant amount of 
of money. And in the long scheme of things, it really isn't a huge, significant amount of money because their careers. Yeah, and in the NFL, I believe the average is about two and a half years. I had aspirations of going there when I was playing in college, but my knee was, my senior year was just not happy. My knee mm -hmm. was like, nope, you can't really go any more. That's the end of it. It was yeah. really sad and depressing. But what I wanted to ask about you with the NFL PA was what are you finding when you, are you seeing that a lot of kids, cause they are your kids, they're somewhere, they're right out of college. You're still mm -hmm. a kid. They're just not prepared mentally to handle the financial responsibilities that come with it. I know that I have a little one and we're trying to get him up to speed on financial things and this and that and the other, what's this, what's that. It just seems like there's none of that and no, certainly not in college. And you would think that's the place that the most, the place where you'd be equipped with some of that. Here's what life is going to be like when you leave. And what's your experience with folks, with kids that are coming straight out of college even and going to NFL? What's their mindset like on this? That's the thing. Like we have such a huge lack of financial literacy in our country. It's a huge problem. And I was through, through Best Prep, who does the Minnesota Business Venture Camp, I, when I was on their board, we had meetings with the Department of Education and I was really focused. It was, the goal of mine was to have it that financial education was required by the time my son went to kindergarten and we almost had it. And then the mm -hmm. Department of Education is like, we don't know how to implement this because is this up in Duluth? Maybe it's under science or how do we put fine? How, where do we put finance in school? And so I had to give up. And it was really super wow. frustrating because I'm like, if I can't, I, like, I can't make change. There's so many roadblocks here from a government standpoint. I don't know what to do. And so we developed a kids in cash program, which then even during the pandemic, my kids were involved and we would have my kids on a zoom teaching other kids about the green light card and wants versus needs and all of these things. And there's this huge issue at any age because the majority of the time people, by the time people come to us, they're usually, usually in their forties. Most of the time they're in their fifties and they're like, I wish I would have done something sooner. And so most people, there isn't a required class. And then some of these states now are starting to require, which is awesome, but we really need something for the average person and particularly that athlete. And frankly, anyone that comes into a sum of money, because it's not just athletes, it's your parent dies and you inherit money, or all of a sudden you get this great job and high salary. What do you do? How do you make smart choices? Because there's so many messages every single day to spend. We don't get messages every Constant. single day to save. No. And <laughs> most of the time, if I've got two kids and I have a spender and I have a saver, and usually that's how it is in relationships. That usually is how it is. Who's with the children. spender? Who's the spender of the two kids? So it's my son, my son, the older one, he's 14. Okay. He's the spender. My daughter is 12 and she's a saver. And ironically, so my son came in, <laughs> into my room last night and he's, I lost $300. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, so like why do you thing? still, why, first off, like, why do you have $300 <laughs> in your room? And are you sure you lost it? Because how many times have you given that to me to put in your green light card to buy more games and stuff? <laughs> He's I got this money for mowing lawns or whatever. And I'm like, where should that go? <laughs> mm. Probably your savings account. So we had this whole conversation last night about CDs and interest rates and 3% and the rule of 72 and all of that, all of that stuff over and over again. And he's interested in it, but again, he's 14. Where does he live? He lives in the world of social media that his friends have the new backpack and you know, he's looking at what car is he gonna be driving at 16 and he makes the comments to me all the time. Oh, I wish we, I just wish you weren't a financial advisor. I wish you were all, like, all these other parents. <laughs> all my friends are getting their cars fully paid for and I have to buy for, pay for half of mine. And I'm like, buddy, that's why they're not clients of mine. <laughs> like, they should be clients of mine because you have to take care of yourself before you take care of your kids. And I get it. Like, I'm a parent, you want to give your kids, but sometimes mm -hmm. you give your kids too much 
and you're enabling them. And it's really sometimes teaching them these hard lessons. And every day that goes by, there's opportunities to talk about money. And it doesn't just have to be your kids. It could be your significant other. That's where we came up with these money date cards. And just, it's all about taking daily life and making it a little bit of fun, but learning something at the same time and being effective and being better when it comes to your money. <clears throat> You said you said that you don't love the word balance. You love you you would rather refer to it as a blend. And I can respect that. Making money fun and experiences are fun. Going away, a vacation, something off your live it list, whatever it might be. But how do you make saving money fun? That's gotta be a huge challenge. How do you take like with your latest book, Who Pays? So this is almost like a self-help book for couples to come together and <laughs> talk about it. But how, if you have one person that's a saver and then their significant other is a spender, how do you bring those two things together without there being a clash or an argument or a fight? I think a lot of people will bend their knee to avoid a fight and let the spender win or let the saver win. But how do you blend that together so that there is not an argument about it? And that's where I encourage people to have money dates and sit down and maybe that money date needs to be with a financial advisor or it needs to be at a public restaurant, but that you start having some of these conversations. And that's where, when I, a client started hearing that I was writing this book about dating and money and one of them, she called me and she's, I don't know if Nicole, but you saved our marriage. Wow. And so it really, for me, that book, I was like, oh, wow. I'm like, this isn't just about dating money. This is like our relationship and like a relationship with money with ourself, let alone mm. if a relationship with someone else with our significant other. And so the book, and then the book became more even blended families and all of that. So it's all the different types of relationships. But when they first came to me, he had been managing the money and he like, that was his thing. And he loved doing it. But what happens is they would refinance and then they would get in credit card debt and then they'd refinance and then get in credit card debt and then they refinance and get credit card debt. And so he came to me and he's, I love investing the money, but I'm done. He's, I can't do it anymore because all we're doing is we're just pay, getting into debt and then refinancing our house paying. And so what we did is we first set up a financial plan for them because you've got to look at what do you want? And when you look, we have a, we have another couple that was like, we want the boat and we want the pontoon and we want a cabin up in <laughs> Northern Minnesota and we want a house in Florida and we want to give all of our car kids cars. When we put that all in and showed them what it looks like and how long they would need to work for all of those things, they're like, yeah, we don't need the second boat and we don't need the cabin up north. A financial plan like helps you see what this looks like and it helps you prioritize because then you're like, Oh, I don't, I'm not going to have a cup of coffee every single day at the coffee shop because I would rather take my kids on a trip to Disneyland. It helps you prioritize. But back to the, this couple that, that she told me I saved their marriage. So we first got a financial plan in from a long-term standpoint, but then her homework, both of their homework, they had to go home and take the credit cards, take a glass of water and put the credit cards in that glass of water and put it in the freezer. <laughs> what happened is... is she physically would have to like pull them out to the front of the freezer because they'd get pushed to the back like so that she could see them and we it's so even though i'm a wealth advisor there's so many days that really i feel like a therapist or a psychologist like it's so much changing your behavior when it comes to your money and it's so much like coming up with solutions and things to make it fun and make it interesting and every person's different they work for you may not work for someone else and it's finding those things to make it fun but it all comes down to again like what is your why what's important to you and so for her she loves to dance and she want dancing is extremely expensive the lessons the costumes all that stuff but it was so important to her she was willing to give up all this other stuff and so we cut their budget in half of what they were spending because she's, I want to dance and that's important to me. And that's her priority. You see where it would be like a marriage counselor. They say that money is the top one, two or three things that couples fight about. So if you're a wealth advisor and me and my wife come and we're sitting across you from the desk, we're already butting heads on the money. And now you are the neutral party that has to say, it's okay. Calm down here. I can see how that would turn into, um, counseling of sorts. Yeah. There's many days <laughs> that we feel like we're <laughs> I want to ask, I want to lean into that because 
the journey has a lot of twists and turns. And obviously you feel some days like you're a therapist more than a financial advisor, <laughs> but I want to lean into that because I want to know what's on the horizon for you, for you, Nicole. I know you said you're not the Madeline Albright, but I bet you're one waiting in the wings, waiting to make some big changes, maybe splash on the scene with something new or different. So what's your vision of what's ahead for you for the next couple of years? Yeah, my plan is uh, to do more public speaking on a bigger national, let alone international level. And next, in a couple of weeks now, I'm headed down to Miami. I'm speaking to financial advisors about how to market themselves, how to do LinkedIn, how do you write a book, how do you do all that? And then I'm going to be down in Florida again. <laughs> if you see a theme, I <laughs> like going to warm places. <laughs> What's happening in Florida? Are you expanding, <laughs> putting roots down in Florida? What's happening there? Eventually, like many Minnesotans, we, most of us end up as residents of Florida <laughs> so that we can have a little bit nicer weather. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Six no, months of winter, who wants to do that? Exactly. But I'll be back down in Florida speaking about living life to the fullest. And, that's, mm. and so that I want to do more with that more public speaking, more inspiring people about life, happiness, and money. And I missed the days that I did a radio show because I missed people calling in and asking financial questions and giving them advice. And so I would love to do a radio show, a national TV show. But again, I don't like that word balance, but I have this blend in life. My kids are 12 and 14 and I still am cool <laughs> in their eyes. <laughs> and so I'm just enjoying those years. In five and a half years, both my kids won't be at home. They'll be at college. And so that is the time, really. And so right now, it's helping more clients, doing more speaking, getting my LinkedIn platform going even more, expanding my network, finding other financial advisors, let alone other women to work at our company. I'd love to expand nationally. But at the same standpoint, having that super mom in me and really focusing on that in five and a half years, that's where I plan to do a lot more national stuff. Dave, she's got to be the most super of moms that we've had on the show. Uh, and you, her take, you take the cake. And your kids still think that. you're kind of, Ooh, that's, that's winning. Too. That is I know, kind of. <laughs> it's, it, there, there's glimpses where I'm like, oh man. <laughs> So in conclusion here, so Nicole, how can folks find you if they want to learn more about your books, about your content, your podcast, your foundation? So we did, we, we mentioned the foundation, but how can folks get in touch with you, especially if they're looking to have you come for some public speaking announcements? Yep. So NicoleMiddendorf.com is where all the speaking, the books, the foundation, everything's there, all the media stuff that I do. And then ProsperWell.com, but you can get to either site from either one. ProsperWell.com is all our investments and our financial planning. And then I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, you know, we're everywhere. <laughs> and I have your entire podcast selection. I also found on NicoleMiddendorf.com. I started back to episode one. I haven't played it yet, and I am definitely looking forward to learning more from you. Awesome. All right, Nicole, thank you for being on with us today. I really appreciated you spending some time with us, sharing sharing the bounty of information that you have. I think we could have been rolling for several more hours. So maybe, we, you know what, Dave, we've got to have her on for a session number two or three in the future if she'll let us have her. I'm definitely going to be following what you're doing out there on LinkedIn, Nicole. Thank you for doing the writing that you do. Very inspirational. All right. Thank you. We've been speaking with Nicole Middendorf, author of Who Pays? Navigating Love and Money and CEO of Prosper Well Financial a financial wealth firm. Thank you very much for joining us at What The Tech, and we look forward to seeing you soon. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to What The Tech. Be sure to check out our other episodes featuring awesome tech and amazing guests. Find them on circuitloops.com or wherever you consume your favorite podcasts.